Okay, well, um, let me just sort of repeat what I said before. Uh, I'm Stephen Bronner. I'm a co-director of the International Council for Diplomacy and Dialogue. To my left is uh, Eric Goslin, who is the other co-director. Um, also on my left, on my, yeah, on my left um, is Vera Tika, who is an expert on uh, the Balkans and who, is, who teaches at the University of uh, Pantheon. And uh, Masha, everyone knows, and um, Ilya, one knows even more. Um, I'm moderating today because our friend Valerie uh, Engel uh, had a tragedy in the family, so he's not here. And I'm going to turn this over to my dear friend and colleague, uh, Nella Navarro, who is right up here on screen, along with uh, Andrew Wolford to, uh, on the right, and below, my other dear, dear friend, Alex Hinton, uh, from Rutgers University, um, as, is ne as is Nella. So Nella, why don't you uh, begin and uh, take it over? Great. Yes. Hi. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good late afternoon. It's really great to be here uh, with all of you. Really grateful to all of our uh, esteemed hosts uh, in Moscow. Uh, I know Andrew and Alex and I are sorry not to be there with all of you. So it's nice to see you uh, there in Moscow. Um, uh, my understanding, uh, Andrew, I think that I won't be the person beginning. Uh, I'm, uh, my understanding uh, today, just to, um, to give you all an, uh, an important update, uh, we each in this panel uh, will be following an order. I'll read the order in just a moment, um, the order that was uh, presented to me. And we have uh, a little over 10 minutes uh, for each person. I will send you a friendly reminder in the chat function but also to be um, to be mindful and respectful of everyone's time and of our of our hosts who have planned so carefully the schedule. I will um, also verbally remind you when you have uh, about approximately two minutes. So if you can please um, manage uh, the time, we will be going in the order in which uh, in which uh, I was uh, suggested that we. Uh, that we uh, in introduce uh, everyone. The introductions will simply be name and affiliation. And uh, we will uh, absolutely have an opportunity uh, for, uh, for Q&A at the end of our uh, one hour now, a little bit, uh, what, it's hour and a half, a little bit less uh, with, it, with the introduction. Uh, one note to all of the panelists, uh, again, um, we do, unfortunately, so we don't have Valerie, and unfortunately, we also... Um, we also not, do not have our Andrew, our, our excuse me, our colleague um, Adam, uh, who's who's a colleague of, of Andrew's. He will unfortunately not be here today, so we do have a little bit of extra time. Uh, and our colleagues have also reminded us um, uh, to uh, our host to please be again be mindful of time. So, without further ado, uh, our panel um, will begin actually with our colleague. Uh, uh, Stephen Bronner, who just presented, uh, who just presented himself, and so uh, uh, Steve, please uh, do begin. Thanks very much, Nella. Um, yes, my topic today is um, is really extremism, civil society, and conflict resolution, and my view of extremism is basically that it's not an ideology, it's an attitude. That is to say, it, can, uh, it infects the left, it infects the right, it even can infect the center. And what it does is, in my opinion, drain ideology of any um, external um, uh, impetus, any external uh, force and if you like, turn the ideology inward. Max Weber once said that politics is not like a taxi cab, which you can stop at the corner and say, I want to get off. 
once the extremist idea is, uh, is sparked, there's an extension of this. We certainly saw that in the United States. We think of um, Donald Trump, of course, as the uh, fi great figure of right-wing extremism. And it is certainly true, as Alex's work uh, shows, uh, that with the election of Trump, uh, right-wing extremist racist white power talk increased enormously. At the same time, uh, this trend, uh, which has now taken over the, com uh, the uh, Republican Party, has its roots deep in American history. The same states that voted for Trump, the same classes that voted for Trump, uh, the same strata, uh, can be traced back almost to the beginning of the country. And for modern purposes, it's important to note that Trump's position was sort of based on the Tea Party, which sprung into um, prominence, in my opinion, because it seemed that mainstream republicanism, it wasn't the left, it was the center. Mainstream republicanism had, if I can put it this way, run out of gas. They had no economic policy in the face of the economic collapse of 2007, 2008. They had no foreign policy because of Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. And I think it's fair to say that uh, domestic policy also was very confused. There was no uh, thrust uh, to it. Now, if one wants to think about it this way, extremism, conservative extremism filled an empty balloon, you know? And uh, we have to note the extraordinary success of this extremist ideology, which, on the right, which began with conservatism on the right and became ever more radical as it went along. We should note something very interesting with regard to this extremism as against uh, the old-style fascism. In spite of the January 6th events, there is no structural, structure of government that is supported or articulated. There is no uh, coherent ideology a la the Nazis that is laid forth, and if you like, there is no repudiation of the, American, of the American government, what, I shouldn't say that, of the American system of democracy. Democracy is still a word that is, that is used. That's different than, uh, than what existed in the 1930s. Um, there is also far less coordination in spite of the uh, talk that has come out about January 6th, uh, when you think of uh, the Nazis in 1923, or you think of the Nazis in 1938, uh, this, uh, this, what took place is really out of the kindergarten. But it fits a certain kind of American extremism on the right, insofar as it's populist. Populists are uh, very skeptical of any kind of structural hierarchy other than a leader. You can have a leader, but you can't have the kind of party organizations that existed, uh, that existed in, in Europe. Now, if I can put it this way, this has come out often enough. The, when one thinks of extremists, on the, on the right, we find in events like in Charlottesville in 2017, a response on the left uh, by Antifa. Antifa means anti-fascist. And they had the slogan, of course, 
uh, smash the fascist when you meet him. In other words, it was a directly violent, unqualified uh, slogan, which, although I don't know if any of them who knew it, uh, is a slogan that comes from the Communist Party of Germany in the 20s, in the late 20s, which came from um, Heinz Neumann and the, uh, the Stalinist wing when they were on the rise, which was smash the fascist when you see him. A terrible um, uh, uh, tactical move because the thing that extremism wants more than anything else is publicity. It feeds on publicity, it eats up publicity, it infuses um, normal discussions and normal political interchange with uh, publicity. Its aim is the sensation. And what I believe is that just as extremism starts to crystallize conservative forces, they become, and you can see this in the Republican Party, there still is virtually no real opposition to the Trump legacy. The question is, how does one respond to this? Does one respond in the manner of Antifa or even the brave uh, people who fought at uh, Charlottesville? I don't think so. I think the only way to respond to this is by really being opposed to it in theory and in practice. And what that means is creating unity, a kind of popular front on the left, which is shaky at best at the moment um, in the Democratic Party. It means going into the Democratic Party, working with the Democratic Party, because that's where the liberal base is, whatever one wants to say. And uh, the idea of forming a front with common articulation of common interests articula that are economic, political, and cultural, uh, uh, cultural, that is the only way to beat extremism. And I think historically this, uh, um, this is borne out by the um, popular front of the 30s, the civil rights movement of the uh, uh, 50s and 60s, which was incredibly successful, not just for bringing civil rights to uh, people of color, but for smashing the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, similarly, in your own revolts against uh, communism and uh, what we saw in the Arab Spring. That is our goal. We don't have that goal uh, realized yet. We don't have it realized in terms of economic policy, as many of you have seen uh, in, the in the conflict over Biden's uh, Build Back Better uh, bill. We don't have it in foreign policy, as you saw with regard to Afghanistan and the treatment of China. And finally, we don't have it in terms of ideology, where a kind of I think dead identity politics is fighting, is uh, at war with the need for uh, a common, universal, humanistic front strategy. That's our goal. I hope we will move forward. And certainly the International Council for Diplomacy and Dialogue wants to help in that effort. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. Our next speaker on the panel is Dr. Alex Hinson, Distinguished Professor of Anthropology and Executive Director and Founding Director of the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights, UNESCO Chair in Genocide Prevention at Rutgers University, the State University in the United States. Alex? Thank you. Yeah. Good, good morning, good afternoon. Um, anyways, it's so nice to be here. And thank you, Professor Navarro, for the uh, introduction. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, Steve for his talk, uh, and especially uh, the organizers of the conference for inviting us to present uh, this panel 
uh, is largely linked into the global consortium on bigotry and hate, uh, which maybe uh, we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, so many of the presentations, including mine, uh, have emerged out of conversations that this global consortium uh, has been having. Um, so I'm going to present a project uh, that uh, has been percolating, moving along uh, during the course of this global consortium. Uh, Professor Navarro, we have 12 minutes, is that right? Or Okay. I'm gonna, and I am yes, going about, to... I'll give you the two minute. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to begin by uh, talking a bit about um, a book that I have published recently uh, that uh, Professor Bronner referred to, um, and uh, I'm going to center my discussion on an apple, two boulders, a chair, and a bird, uh, and use that as a way to talk about extremism, but especially uh, in terms of the focus of this conference, uh, counter-response. So there, there you have the the apple, the two boulders, the chair, uh, and the bird. Uh, and uh, have to excuse me, I've had a problem with jumping slides. So they sometimes jump too ahead. So I'm flipping back and forth. That's what's going on. Uh, so this is the bird, uh, the sort of image uh, to begin things before I end with the bird. Um, we begin with the apple. But I want to point out the framing question that I have here. It can happen here, and this is set in the context of the U.S., uh, and it emerges from uh, the resurgence of white power extremism uh, that took place during the Trump administration, uh, obviously, uh, and importantly, and is underscored by Professor Bronner. This has a very long history, and I'll get into that a, a tiny bit. Um, but for those who may not be familiar uh, with some of the events in the U.S., um, perhaps I assume most people know about the uh, far right, you know, the right rally in Charlottesville in 2017. And we actually have a trial, uh, a civil trial that's going on right now, and it's concluding this week. Um, but then we also had attacks, for example, the Tree of Life Synagogue uh, shooting, the attack in El Paso, and of course, uh, the event that now everyone is focused on, the Capitol insurrection where it, become, it has become increasingly clear that it was a coup attempt uh, in the US. Um, so these events sort of in the backdrop in terms of the formulation of my project, uh, you know, people were talking about this equation of Hitler and Trump. This one dates back to 2015 when he was running for office. I'm not making that equation. This is the way people talked about it. Uh, and in terms of far right extremism, some of these resonances uh, and sort of linking into fascism, uh, you know, the Unite the Right rally where people yelled blood and soil, uh, Jews will not replace us, you will not replace us. Uh, in the U.S., all of these sort of gave rise to this discussion that became the focus of my, uh, you know, my book, Can It Happen Here? So the bad apples, uh, maybe you can guess who the bad apples are, uh, but the bad apple uh, explanation uh, very quickly emerged in the context of Charlottesville and relationship to Trump and relationship to the far, uh, to the different people who participate in the January 6th insurrection. Uh, but the, uh, this idea is that as opposed to being people like all of us, these people were all deviant. Uh, they were haters, they were racist, they were bigots. Uh, they were something other than what is normal, everyday, commonplace widespread. So this gives rise to two conceptual blockages. Um, and I will get ahead to the reified consciousness in a minute. Um, but the first is uh, one that says, well, since they're racist and I'm not, they're not like me. They're deviant. Since they're haters, they're not like me since I'm not a hater. This is a sort of logic of the not me. So it gives rise to this first myth of the hater, uh, which prevents us from understanding far-right extremism in the US. The second 
myth uh, is the myth of U.S. exceptionalism. Uh, and it's the idea that, uh, you know, stuff like this has nothing to do with the U.S. It bubbles up once in a while. It's unfortunate. But uh, by and large, the history of the U.S. is one of progress, manifest destiny, um, and spectacular achievement. Uh, so these two blockages uh, impede us from understanding. Uh, they frame things as an exception, as opposed to considering that they may be the rule. Um, and for one quick example, uh, if we focus, for example, on the hater and explain these things in terms of hate, we don't pay attention to discursive formations, to discourses of hate. So we're, we individualize as opposed to looking to the broader structures that give rise to, uh, to phenomena like far-right extremism in the U.S., uh, the same thing with racism. When people refer to other people as racist, uh, I always, I don't want to say cringe for most, you know, and certainly in the sense, uh, and it speaks, there's a, you know, the kernel of truth to it. But the point is that every time we refer to a racist, we divert away from structural racism. So we need to pay attention to structure and not agency. When we pay attention to agency, the bad apples, we divert away from uh, explaining and understanding far-right extremism. So that's, those are the two boulders. Uh, and now I want to refer to the boulders as boulders of a particular sort, uh, as, the, as the Adorno boulders. So in keeping with the counter response, um, I want to talk a bit about Adorno. Uh, and that's a picture of his uh, desk in Frankfurt. Um, and that's the desk. And just have a reminder what, uh, you know, of this famous saying, the premier demand upon all educations, thou shouldst not happen again. So what exactly does this mean? And there's also an essay I enjoy teaching and taught this year. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly difficult essay for undergraduates, but it's an important one. Well, so sort of going back to those conceptual blockages, um, Adorno refers to reified consciousness and he talks about it uh, in different ways, but one of them is a blindness to the historical, to the past, to the way in which the current moment is conditioned both by larger structures, and I referred a bit to those structures, uh, and also those histories that gave rise to them. Um, and uh, for Adorno, he urges that these be ruptured. So if you think of the boulders, you know, as educators, as scholars, as those who are trying to develop a, a counter response, we need to rupture, shatter, remove those blockages that we have. So one, you know, sort of example of this uh, is as opposed to looking at far right extremism in the U.S. as exceptional to view it as symptomatic as the the rule, it's something that's existed, it goes back, uh, you know, not just to 1619. Uh, we can certainly and should look all the way back to 1492 and beyond uh, with global capitalism, uh, slave trade, uh, colonialism in its different forms, including the settler colonialist form that, that emerged in the U.S. And it was deeply intertwined uh, with white power extremism in different forms, including those forms that persist and exist today. So again, you know, just sort of the basic point, it can happen here. These sorts of events are not exceptional. They're symptomatic. They demand uh, that, as Adorno said, uh, that we unpack reified consciousness, we rupture uh, that which has been frozen, and we begin to sort of understand how we arrived at this moment uh, and its historical, uh, sociological, and structural complexities. Uh, so again, sort of thinking of the boulders to shift the metaphor a tiny bit uh, in terms of structural power, uh, the imperative in terms of education is to historicize and denaturalize. This is the rupturing, uh, some of the rupturing that uh, Adorno uh, was talking about. One example in terms of the U.S. Uh, is our current discussion of a phrase that was academic, certainly new, and others, but nobody was really talking about all that much um, structural racism. Now in the U.S., this is a 
sort of a widespread uh, discourse, though I expect, as usually happens, in three or four years, people won't be talking about this term and it'll sort of fade away as a moment. Uh, that's a different story uh, linked to the presidency of, uh, of Trump. Um, but again, uh, it provides an illustration of uh, structure and how it has many different forms to undergird uh, the sort of racism that helps propel um, far-right extremists. Um, and again, I don't say racist, I say racism, again, to emphasize structure and history. Moving to another aspect of what Adorno was talking about when uh, in education uh, after Auschwitz, uh, he says we need to understand the mechanisms, right? So if we don't understand the history and the structure, uh, you know, we can understand how, what's driving, what different mechanisms uh, exist that are propelling something like far-right extremism forward uh, for um, Adorno, this, this involved uh, revealing, you think about what's behind the boulders moving forward into that fog and seeing, um, and also uh, it's an awakening of both ourselves, but as educators, those of us who teach, um, you know, of our students. Uh, and for Adorno, this was absolutely critical uh, to prevention and to fighting against the lack of reflection, the reified consciousness uh, that was underneath uh, one of the key factors underlying uh, extremism, bigotry, and hate. Um, so in the, in the book, uh, I take up, uh, you know, different lessons as a motif and different forms, which I don't have a, a lot of time to go into. Um, I have a, I talk about a Charlottesville teach-in that took up uh, you know, this event that we had where people sort of explained away saying, oh, it's a bunch of racists and haters, crazy, so on and so forth. And taking that event and rooting it in history, in the context um, of the concept of race as it emerged in this history, uh, drawing on critical pedagogy um, and drawing on uh, deconstruction of notions of the hater as well as the different groups uh, involved in Charlottesville, along with this idea of historicize and denaturalize. In terms of denaturalization, uh, you know, this is one example. So what is the ideology? Um, Professor Bronner uh, just talked about this uh, as well uh, in important ways, um, but this is a way to visualize it. So amidst the multiple sets of ideas, one of the prominent ideas that now circulates often in the guise of replacement theory is the idea of white genocide. Um, and this sort of goes to reify consciousness, what you see, the top, the tip of the iceberg, what's manifest, you need to go underneath, probe, uh, historicize, look at the structures underlying it. Uh, and in my book, I go into detail about this in terms of the idea of white genocide, which is a key frame that helps propel uh, white power extremism, which can be viewed as a social movement as opposed to, you know, momentary aberration of a bunch of crazies uh, emerging, uh, you know, demonstrating. Uh, anyways, you know, in terms of the discourse, I'm not going to read this whole quote, maybe just the end to note that this is a neo-Nazi. Um, he works at a neo-Nazi newspaper, uh, you know, and he says here, we're going to clear them from the streets, that which is degenerate and white countries will be removed. You ain't seen nothing yet. Um, it's nothing new. What One important point to underscore is that this sort of discourse is said in a coarse manner um, by uh, that neo-Nazi uh, reporter uh, was also manifest in the discourse of, uh, you know, mainstream U.S. politics, including uh, then-President Trump, who drew upon white nationalists and white genocide ideas frequently and made, uh, you know, racist uh, dog whistles to his followers to galvanize the crowd. Uh, as I mentioned, I talked about white genocide uh, in a chapter. Um, so, I've done the bad apple, the two boulders, the chair of education, uh, and also Adorno's desk is a method of critical inquiry, critical pedagogy. And I've already been talking about the bird, which is ways that we can uh, prevent this, move beyond it. 
Um, I'm not going to go into any detail. I'm going to wrap up here. Um, but in terms of prevention, you know, what can we do? There are lots of different sorts of things ranging from transitional justice uh, to moral compass uh, and uh, risk. But I just want to show in terms of risk assessment uh, as well, uh, you know, we need to monitor and try and understand the different factors uh, that are catalyzing what the degree of threat is and what's been really Many things have been worrisome in the U.S., but, uh, you know, in the April of 2019, things were getting bad. By the fall of 2020, they were absolutely, in terms of traditional risk assessment, uh, getting off the chart. Uh, and after Biden uh, took over the presidency and sort of got through the attempted coup, uh, the sort of expectation was this would die down and we'd go back to a low simmer um, but in fact, the situation in the U.S. is still now at a rapid simmer and has the potential to escalate uh, and appears to be moving in that direction. Uh, so I will end with that, uh, with the bird, uh, which is a metaphor that I end my book with that comes from Toni Morrison's Nobel Prize speech uh, about dialogue, multivocality, uh, and the exact oppositeness um, of the frozen speech. Uh, that we have with far-right extremism and the discourses of our former president, uh, Trump. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alex. We appreciate it. Um, just a, a quick reminder and note, we, if you notice in the, those of you who are, are in Moscow, our colleague uh, Tali is unable to join us. She's unable to, 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 um, to connect because of connectivity issues uh, where she is currently. So, um, we are uh, we are scheduled to have uh, Valerie next, and then Adam. As you know, they will not un be able un unable to join us, and so I'm really delighted to uh, turn our, us now to listen to our colleague, Dr. Andrew Woolward, who's professor of sociology and criminology at the University of Manitoba, and again one of the members of the consortium that Alex has uh, referred to. And he will be, uh, his, his talk is entitled COVID-19, Ecofascism in the Far Right in North America, Reframing and Counteracting Hate and Hate Adjacent Discourses. Andrew, thank you. Great, thank you, Nala. And uh, thank you to Ilya and Lilia for organizing our session today. Um, my research is a little less further along than some of my colleagues. This is a really the starting blocks for this study for me. Um, but what I want to look at is the ways in which um, far-right discourses use intersecting or bridging discourses to try to expand their pool of potential adherence uh, for their movement, the social movement, as Alex referred to. So I'm going to, oh, sorry, I moved too fast here. So George Mondiot has written recently in The Guardian, about slippages between the discourses of the right and the left, which he feels are happening with greater frequency these days. Slippage, he suggests, has been most profound or most pronounced around COVID-19 as the circulating conspiracy theories about the pandemic or the vaccines designed to end it, bring together some strange bedfellows from all over the political spectrum. Such uncomfortable overlaps are not new to the present era, though they are perhaps magnified by it. Earlier uncomfortable crossings have taken place with respect to climate catastrophe, like when the far right exploited points of alignment with deep ecology to nudge the latter at times towards ecofascism, such as by redirecting biocentrism toward anti-immigration and ethnic nativism. White people under ecofascist thinking are envisioned as indigenous protectors of the land whose job is to prevent interlopers from despoiling it. Purity, blood, and soil are presented as key elements of an ecological life. Likewise, questions of the impact of population growth, growth at times bleed into neo Malthusian statements regarding who should be allowed to perish or who should be permitted to reproduce. And this can also have unfortunate alignment with some um, thinking on the ecological left. Uh, such as when Earth First founder David Foreman welcomed famine as a form of population correction and balancing. So we see these alignments taking place or this overlap between far right thinking and um, ecological thinking sometimes in very uh, dramatic circumstances such as the El Paso and Christchurch um, shootings where the shooters um, 
both included eco-fascist logics in their respective manifestos to rationalize their mass murders. And it's also worth noting that recent QAnon adherents, such as Jake and Jelly, uh, the so-called QAnon shaman, promote, uh, quote, cleansed ecosystems and other eco-fascist ideas. So there's been stories shared of supposed rewilding in urban spaces under the pandemic conditions. Images of Welsh sheep using merry-go-rounds or dolphins in Venetian canals are, are said to be fakes, but are accompanied by texts that suggest, quote, Cor coronavirus is Earth's vaccine. We are the, we are the, we are the virus. Um, the more than human here is enlisted to spread a message that echoes earlier white supremacist slogans such as save trees, not refugees, that tie the fear of ecological threat to that of the stranger. The ecological message becomes an instance of what Jay Fraser refers to as fascist adjacent messaging, an entryway for the spread of far right talking points by bridging them with other justice frames. This gives them what Alex has referred to in his other work as ontological resonance. In transmitting this message to the broader center right, resonance is achieved, for example, by presenting COVID public health orders and vaccine passports as preparation for increasing government overreach, uh, which they will use to combat climate change, thus linking these issues to increasing numbers. And then also, of course, sorry, skip this part here. Um, and also creating this sort of entanglement of various strands of discourse to suggest to their listeners that everyday people are going to be asked to make sacrifices while governments continue to allow polluting outsiders to cross borders. This allows the listener to draw a line connecting multiple ontological threats, providing a narrative that places blame clearly on current government and opening the door for a more isolationist right-wing government to appear to offer solutions. Uh, Anti-vax perspectives also have crossover potential for spreading far-right discourses among some of the countercultural or self-described progressive left. Um, it's important to recall that elements of the Nazi movement espouse ecological beliefs related to physical health, natural healing, and bodily purity. These themes continue to run through many segments of today's far-right, but also align with wellness frames of the naturist left, sometimes sweeping the latter up in far-right campaigns. Likewise, suspicions of big pharma is common on both the far-right and progressive circles and is another potential point of resonance. Now, where we see this in Canada is through this figure of Chris Sakachia, also known as Chris Sky, who describes himself as, quote, the world's most prolific human rights defender. He's a bodybuilder, builder, um, son of a, um, a very wealthy, he was born into a very wealthy family, and he's used his opposition to vaccines and mask mandates to draw together a very diverse pool of people who borrow discourses from all over the political spectrum. You can see on this one fellow's shirt, the slogan, hugs, not masks, Hus hugs over masks. Um, there's another sign back, freedom is essential. Uh, the other, other slogans they use are just say no and quote, united non-compliance. Um, Drawing from frames of reference from feminism, libertarianism, uh, civil rights movement, and a wide variety of other sources. Um, Sky likewise combines concerns for government tyranny, surveillance, and overreach with a focus on fitness, um, bodily health, and he derides what he calls the experimental injection that he suggests alters DNA and makes people more contagious. He also minimizes the deaths of the elderly, that have been brought by COVID and mocks those who accept mask mandates and vaccines as being weak-minded sheep calling, he calls on men to be men and to assert their freedom. So his frame alignments thus converge not only with eco-fascist ones, but with a wide variety of alt-right and other social movement themes. And I should mention that Chris Guy, Sakachia in his own background has um, previously um, spread discourses from anti-black, anti-Semitic, a uh, great replacement and other common themes of the far right. So I'm going to finish up here. I'm sure I only have a few minutes left. Um, but so the far right is demonstrating. Uh, 
<laughs> the far right has demonstrated its capacity to mobilize around emerging crises, whether ecological or pathogenic, and to bridge frames across multiple movements. Through their zeal to connect nearly everything and anything to their conspiratorial arc, it is inevitable that contradictions will emerge. For example, the, their recent willingness, at least by some on the, new, on the far right, to embrace climate science to advance anti-immigration views can rub up against their dismissal of COVID-19 science. But simply pointing to inconsistencies or showing the illogicality of their presentations has not succeeded thus far in stemming the associative expansionism of their discourses. Uh, some suggest the answer to preventing frame bridging and growth in the far right requires long-term strategies around training young people with the scientific literacy and critical thinking skills needed to challenge misinformation, uh, certainly increasing the historical knowledge, the critical thinking abilities. Um, you know, as discussed by Alex, I think is a very important route we have to consider encountering these discourses. Um, it's also suggested that there needs to be more work preventing social media algorithms from facilitating frame bridging between the moderate and the far right. Um, current anti-hate speech algorithms that are used by some social media platforms are too readily circumvented by those seeking to gain new adherence to, um, to problematic, I problematic, um, problematic ideologies. Uh, and they may even be biased against um, BIPOC individuals, for example, because they tend to focus on keywords, sometimes words that have been reappropriated by